Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak here, especially given this wonderful occasion. Uh, it's, it's great to be here for Georges' uh, conference. Um, I, uh, I'm going to save the stories for, for Thursday, but let, let me just say that um, uh, you know, I hadn't had the pleasure of co collaborating or, or, or uh, directly working with Georges, but I know, of course, of, of him a lot, and in particular, um, I remember that the first book that, or the first notes that Wojtulowski asked me to read when I was a graduate student were some KK theory notes of Georges, and many people attested to Georges' teaching ability and you know, his power as a teacher. I have a personal s story to share in that re regard. When I was at Institut Henri Poincaré uh, three or four years ago, it so happened that my wife was busy and I had to bring my kids to, uh, to a lecture, which actually was a lecture of George. So the, the older one, I think, was 10 years old or something like that. And I was amazed that they actually were following the lecture. I mean, I think they had no choice. They, they, they did that. And so after that, I, 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 somebody, I forgot, I think maybe in Jean-Luc Sauvage or somebody, he asked the older one, what was the lecture about? And the guy looked at him and said, it was about some spectra of operators or something like that. So. <laughs> So I was amazed. I mean, if you can make a 10-year-old, you know, uh, pay attention. Then. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so this is part of a kind of a free day today because the afternoon is genuinely free and I noticed that all the morning talks have free in them. So this is about free probability of type B and I also noticed that there are lots of Bs because, um, you know, in free probability we have, well, I don't know what's going on with that thing, but uh, we have this, this B-free or bi-free probability that Wojtulescu is going to talk about uh, right after my talk, then uh, uh, there is something called B-valued free probability theory, which is the case where you amalgamate things over B. Uh, this already, uh, let me try to connect this better. I don't know if this may be the bad connector or something like that. Uh, seems to be losing sync. Um, this, there's some connection with uh, Cyril Houdaillet's talk. So mine is a type B free probability, whatever that is. And I realize that probably the, the, the reason for the number of Bs is simply because it is a birthday conference. So, <laughs> so happy birthday. Anyway, so the, to start with the talk. So the talk really starts uh, 60 years ago. Uh, this is you know, the result of Wigna from something like 50 five or something like that. Uh, of course, this is not the result of Wigner, but something that he was close to what he was doing. So you're looking at the following problem. You take a, a, a random matrix. So just for definiteness, we take a n to be an n by n matrix whose entries are Gaussian random variables. So the matrix is taken to be self-adjoint, but then the entries inside are maximally independent, subject to them being self-adjoint. So the entries on the diagonal are real, the entries above the diagonal are complex, and the real parts and the imaginary parts and the diagonal parts are all independent, and, and they're more or less all uh, variance one over n squared, uh, one over square root of n, sorry, one over n it should be. Sorry, this is a mistake, one over n, except that the diagonal ones for technical reason have a slightly higher variance than that. And so what one is concerned with is, is the following thing, so you pick uh, an instance of such a random matrix, so the, the matrix is, is varying randomly, and you look at its eigenvalues, so let's order them lambda 1 through lambda n. Of course, these kind of jump around as you vary the matrix. And then for each, uh, for each such set of eigenvalues, you consider a measure where you put a delta mass at each one of the eigenvalues. So it's a probability measure the way we've normalized it. And so it's a random measure. So that measure is moving as, as the matrix moves around. And so what you, what you prove is that uh, as, as the size of the matrix goes to infinity, on average, this measure will look like the semicircle law. So what it means is that if you, if you were to take a, a, a random matrix, or actually a bunch of random matrices, and then you average how many eigenvalues of them are in each one of these small intervals, so I plotted a histogram of how many there are, then this, the shape of this thing will be, the, will be that of a semicircle. 
Okay, so this is, this is Wigner's, Wigner's theorem. So then uh, something like, uh, what, 25 years ago, this got a, a major upgrade from Wojculescu, who um, connected the behavior of random matrices with um, asymptot with, with, with free probability. So here's a, a sample of, of, uh, of, of the theorem. I mean, basically, the, the point is that the occurrence of the semicircle law, which is the kind of the free Gaussian law, is not... Um, not for free, it, it, there's a reason for it. Um, and one instance is this, so you take this AN as before, a Gaussian random matrix, and then you fix some matrices BN, which are deterministic, for whom you provide the eigenvalues. So BN is a diagonal matrix with these specified eigenvalues. And let's assume that the associated measure weakly converges to some measure mu B. Then what Wojculescu proves is that AN and BN are actually asymptotically free. So they behave as for large N as if they were free random variables. So in particular, if you're interested in the sum of AN and BN and looking at the, uh, this is called the empirical spectral measure, by the way. So if you look at the empirical spectral measure of the sum of A and B, then that behaves as if A and B were actually free. So it converges to what's called the free additive convolution um, of, of these two measures. And so the, you know, the way this is, uh, I mean, just to give you an example, we take uh, B three times uh, a projection of, of, of half the maximal rank. So you take B to be a matrix which has N over two entries three and N over two entries zero. And then if you add A and B, this is the picture you get. So you see you, you get a kind of a slightly deformed semicircle law centered or more, more or less centered at zero and a slightly deformed semicircle law, which is more or less centered at three. And um, this is a computation that you can actually do in free probability theory, right? I mean, you, you're all, I'm sure, very familiar with that. So Wojculescu was able to not just connect the uh, random matrices with free probability theory, but he, he developed a, a, a very nice theory behind this kind of free convolution, uh, so there's this analytical theory, which many of you have, have heard about, uh, probably you've all heard about something called R-transform, right, which is a kind of a linearizing transform for additive convolution. But there is a little bit more behind this theory, which uh, was discovered in the work of, of Philippe Bian and, and, and Wojculescu, and, and there's been a lot of follow-up work by, by many people, which has to do with free subordination. So let me just briefly review this. So the setting is that you're interested in uh, co computing the, the uh, free additive convolution of two measures, so mu a and mu b, and eta is the, is the convolution. And then, of course, the important role here is played by the Cauchy transform. So you take this g nu, which is the Cauchy transform, which is this integral. If you like uh, operator algebraically, this is just the trace of a resolvent of an operator. And so the statement for this uh, subordination result says that, well, if you look at the Cauchy transform of the convolution of two measures, then its value at z can be expressed at the, as the value of the Cauchy transform of either one, mu a or mu b, but evaluated at some other point, uh, omega a or omega b. And this, is, this, this shift by which you have to, to, to change the point um, is determined by certain analytic functions, omega a and omega b, which are functions taking the upper half plane to the upper half plane. Now, these functions are not arbitrary. Uh, they, they satisfy a certain uh, uh, compatibility. Namely, there is this thing. If you add them, then you get uh, z plus the reciprocal of the Cauchy transform of the, of, the, of the convolution. And then if you want omega a and omega b to be completely determined, then there is a certain behavior at, at I infinity that, that uh, fixes them. And if you've heard about R transform and things like this, let me just very quickly uh, point out the connection. If you call F the reciprocal of the Cauchy transform, then Wojculescu's formulas of the R transform is the inverse uh, of, of F. This means inversion as, as, a, as a function of one very complex variable. So the R transform is the inverse of the reciprocal plus Z. And so the usual equation for the R transform that you're probably all familiar with, that the R transform linearizes convolution, becomes this equation. It says that if you add the reciprocals of the, of the, the inverses of the reciprocals of the Cauchy transforms, then you get more or less the reciprocal of the other one plus Z. 
And then if you um, rewrite this equation here this way, just taking reciprocals of everything, then you see that the correct choice for the subordination function is simply this, this composition here. And in fact, uh, this equation here, well, rewritten this form, precisely becomes the equation that uh, says that the R transforms at, right? So uh, these subordination functions are somehow not very far from the, the kind of complex machinery that one, one uses to, to handle free convolution. I mean, of course, this, the, the hard part in this definition is to prove that this actually is defined in the, the large domain and things like that. Okay. Well, fast forward another, uh, this would be something like five years ago. Um, this is a similar question, uh, was considered first by uh, Gerard Benarus, Rousse, uh, Baik, and Peche. So, you start again with a n, let's say, like before, uh, an n by n random Gaussian matrix, but this time, instead of looking at its sum with uh, some, some big matrix, you look at a finite rank matrix. So you fix a finite rank matrix b n. Just for simplicity, imagine it's theta times a rank one projection. And then one is interested in things like, what's the law, what, what's the empirical spectrum measure of a n plus b n? Now, for, for, uh, if you look at an plus bn, and you look somehow on average what's happening, of course this rank one projection doesn't do anything, right? Because if you, if you look at the usual statistics uh, of, of uh, you know, this kind of distribution of eigenvalues, you see that one extra eigenvalue or something like this that this, this finite rank perturbation provides cannot do anything, right? I mean, it will come out in the wash. Um, but if you actually look at finite n uh, at the spectrum of, of this matrix, there's a very interesting phenomenon. And this was the discovery of, of, uh, of, of these three people, although they were doing actually slightly different thing. They were looking at a multiplicative perturbation, but anyways, it's, it's a, a similar phenomenology. So you see, if you take theta, theta is, this, is how much of the projection you add. If you take theta big, then you have a kind of a semicircle law here, but then you typically have an eigenvalue far out. And this is called an outlier. On the other hand, if this state is sufficiently small, then actually you just get the kind of semicircular part. If you look at it, it's actually slightly uh, crooked, right? It's slightly higher here than there. But anyways, it looks like a kind of a semicircle and no outlier. And in fact, there is a precise uh, phase transition behavior for a certain critical theta. Um, uh, it switches from doing this to doing that. Okay, so that's what they discovered. Now, people start, there's actually a, a whole bunch of uh, work that was done on this by, by a variety of people, but um, in particular, it was discovered by Mireille Capitan and by Sherban Bilinski, Harry Berkovici, Mireille Capitan, and Maxime Fervier, that um, if you really want to understand where that outlier lives, somehow you must use the same kind of analytic machinery that goes into free convolution. So somehow, um, in, for instance, in our problem where you look at a n and b n, a n this, this Gaussian matrix and b n um, a rank one matrix with non-zero eigenvalue theta, then somehow what you must do is this. First of all, you look at uh, a pair of subordination functions that goes with the free convolution of the semicircle law and the limit of this b n which, of course, you know, you ignore the, the one eigenvalue, it's just the delta function at zero. So when you work it out, the, the one function is trivial and the other one is just the, the uh, reciprocal, the inverse of the reciprocal of the uh, Cauchy transform of, of, of the semicircle law. And then the answer is that there will be an outlier at theta prime precisely when it solves this equation. So when there is a real solution theta prime to um, to, to this equation, okay? So, in other words, this is the equation here. Okay. And the question that puzzled me for, for quite some time actually is why? I mean, it sounds like there's still some kind of free independence involved, right? Because the, the functions involved are exactly the, the stuff that you do when you do, you know, convolution and things like that. But on the other hand, it's quite clear that a and b and do not fit in the usual way of doing, doing free probability theory. 
So the idea to, to, to do this comes with um, trying to keep track of a little bit more than the limit law of an and bn. So here's the idea. Imagine we look at the law of the empirical spectral measure of a n plus b n at a fixed n and watch this as a function of n. Well, as n goes to infinity, we're going to get some leading order terms, so a term of order 1, right? This is the limit. This is what free probability will compute for us. But then we have a, a, a first order correction to that, which will be something of order 1 over n. And then we'll have high order corrections, so things that, that are, are negligible compared to 1 over n. And the idea is that this, this, this uh, first order term, mu dot, is the one that is responsible for watching one eigenvalue, right? Because if you were to take a matrix, there are n eigenvalues altogether. If you to take one eigenvalue and move it drastically somewhere else, then this would be a perturbation of order 1 over n. So what we need to do is we need to understand if, if there is some kind of a framework that keeps track not just of the empirical spectral measure of a n uh, plus b n, but of that plus a 1 over n correction. Now it turns out that this, this setting was already explored um, in, in a work that I did with Sherban Belinsky, it appeared in 2012. And this is what we call somehow infinitesimal uh, probability space. This is a thing where, you know, in, in classical probability, you talk about the probability space. So this is the, you know, the algebra of random variables and, and uh, the expectation functional. And Vojkulasko talks about a non-commutative probability space like that. Here you add one more piece of data. You add this thing called phi prime which you should think of as, as somehow giving you a first order correction to the law. So a typical situation you have is that you have a family of laws, phi t, which somehow depends nicely on t, and then this phi and phi prime are the uh, zeroth and first order corrections to your phi t. Yeah? So another example is if you have a, a family of a fixed family, so you have fixed uh, a prob probability space, but you have a family of variables, then you can look at their law. So you look, for instance, at their moments, these moments depend on t, and then um, the, the, uh, th this is the setting you're in. So the, the zeroth and first order term of these moments is what you keep track of. Now, why did we look at this, at this uh, infinitesimal uh, thing? Well, the story is kind of weird. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, you, can, you can define um, what, what it means to be infinitesimally free. It's pretty obvious. You say that two subalgebras, a1, a2, are infinitesimally free, if, well, take, define a, a, a law by saying phi t is phi plus t phi prime and require that with respect to this law, the appropriate freeness condition is satisfied up to high order terms, right? And if you write this down, then this is what you get. I mean, um, uh, Cyril, I think, wrote the, the condition for freeness last time. So this is a condition on phi. It just says that to, to order one, these, uh, these algebras actually are free. But then it says that actually to next order, they're also free. And if you, if you work out what, what, what uh, Cyril's condition uh, is, they somehow take a derivative of it, you see that this is exactly what you need. Uh, now, why did we want to do this? It, it, it's an interesting story. Um, we wanted to understand or bring some complex analysis tools to understand something called type B free probability, which was introduced by Philippe Bian, Fred Goodman, and uh, Andu Nika. Now, their motivation was like this. They, they realized that the, the, the passage from classical probability to free probability, and this is well known, um, entails replacing in various formulas summation uh, over the lattice of all partitions by summation over the lattice of non-crossing partitions. But then it turns out that these, these non-crossing partitions, they're something that's called type A non-crossing partitions. And besides type A non-crossing partitions, which are these, I mean, you, here's a non-crossing partition of 1, 6, right? I mean, uh, the condition that a partition is non-crossing is saying that if you have four numbers which are ordered like this, and if the, the middle two of them, I and, G, I, I and K, are in the same block of the partition, and then the other two are also in the same block of the partition, then they all must be in the same block, yeah? So, so this thing cannot happen, right? Uh, you, you cannot have uh, a crossing, right? So besides these type A partitions, there are something called type B partitions. 
So it looks kind of weird. You, th these are partitions on two n numbers, but they, they are written like this. It's one through six, but then it's minus one through minus six, ordered as, as on the board. And then the condition is that uh, it should be a non-crossing partition of these 12 numbers, subject to the condition that if B is a block, then if I negate all the elements of B, that again must be a block. Okay? Now, there are two ways that this can happen. One is, is what, what I drew here. So you just take a, a non-crossing partition of the first six numbers, so just the usual type A non-crossing partition, and then you copy the same uh, non-crossing partition over. Right? That, of course, satisfies the, uh, the constraint. But then it, it, it can happen that there can be exactly one block that mixes positive and negative numbers. So here's an example. This is the, the block that mixes 6 and 6. Okay? And this block is special because it itself is globally invariant under negation. And so this is what, what combinatorists call the zero block. Now, why are they called type A and type B? Um, well, one instance, for instance, is that the type A non-crossing partitions, they have to do with uh, geodesics in the symmetric group. So if you, if you take the symmetric group Sn, and you look at the generating set of Sn, which consists of all uh, transpositions, okay, then you can look at geodesics that connect the neutral element to the maximal cycle, to the, 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 the partition that permutes completely 1 through n. And uh, it turns out that such geodesics, um, well, they're, okay, so if, if you have any partition, uh, sorry, any, any um, partition, then you can attach to it a permutation in the following way. You just take this partition and write it as, as blocks. So maybe I should draw it on the board. So suppose I have some partition. Uh, it doesn't have to be non-crossing, actually, for this. So let's say it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So let's say that the blocks are something like that. Then to it, you attach a permutation where you look at the cycle 1, 3, then uh, 2, 4, 5, and 6. Right? So that's, that's the formula. And so the statement is that um, in this correspondence, if you look at, at um, uh, somehow increasing chains of non-crossing partitions that go from the, the partition um, that, that has n classes to a partition that has only one class, these precisely correspond to, to, to geodesics uh, in, in this setting that connect the neutral element to the maximal cycle. And now Sn has to do with type A Lie groups, and you can replace uh, uh, Sn by by the hyperoctahedral group, which, has, which is type B, right? And so that turns out to be the, the correct replacement. Is Another way of saying it is that there is a way of realizing these things, um, uh, connecting them with hyperplane arrangements, and there are type A and type B, and, and that's, that's what's going on. Anyway, so they had this, this, uh, this theorem going, this theory going. They had a notion of uh, free independence, they had a free convolution done combinatorially, so summing over this lattice of, of partitions. And the connection with infinitesimal probability comes from the fact that somehow these two functionals, phi and phi prime, they correspond to the two types of, of, non -cross, of type B non-crossing partitions that you have. You have ones that have no zero block, so these are ones which are just a non-crossing partition followed by a copy of a non-crossing partition. So that, that somehow goes with the phi part of the, of the probability space. And then you have things that have a zero block, right? So they have this block that mixes positive and negative, and somehow they correspond to the phi prime part. Anyways, what we, what we were um, interested in are, um, uh, is doing some kind of analysis. So, so for that, it was better to talk about this kind of infinitesimal setting. And here's, for instance, a theorem that we were able to prove. So suppose you, you give yourself mu1, mu1 prime, and mu2, mu2, mu2 prime infinitesimal laws. So what does that mean? It means that mu1 and mu2 are probability measures. And um, mu1 prime and mu2 prime 
they are somehow, I mean, I mean, they're no longer probability measures, right? I mean, one of the requirements, for instance, is that they annihilate one, because, of course, you want to say that if you perturb a probability measure by this mu j prime, that it stays a probability measure. But, but this mu j prime uh, is a kind of a distribution, so it's, 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 a, well, it's a linear functional on a certain class of functions. Um, okay, and now let's say that you take x1 t, x2 t, variables whose laws are given as mu j to first order and mu j prime as the second order correction, and assume that you take them free, so x1 of t realizing mu1 and x2 of t realizing mu2 are actually free. Then the conclusion is that if you take their sum, so let's call it y of t, like that, its law will be some pro probability measure plus a correction term, and you can work out what, what this thing is. So at, at, at the order one level, of course, you just have the usual uh, Voiculescu additive convolution. And at the next order level, if you define appropriately what you mean by the Cauchy transform of, um, of this object, eta prime, then there's a certain formula which, you see, it involves the Cauchy transforms of the, of the two objects, mu prime, mu one prime, and mu two prime. And the subordination functions omega 1 of z and its derivative and the subordination function omega 2 of z and its derivative, where omega j are the subordination functions which are somehow adapted to this, to this free convolution thing. Okay. So it's a formula that, if you like, you could say it like this. You could simply take the, the free convolution of, of, of this guy, uh, mu x1 t and mu x2 t, and then you look and you differentiate it in t. And you can also do the similar thing for multiplicative convolution and so forth, right? I mean, there's, there's some, some machinery for that. Okay, so here's the theorem. This is the thing that actually gives you the, the link between uh, these matrices and finite rank perturbations. So here's what it is. Let's look at uh, AN, this is our Gaussian random matrix, and BN, this is our finite rank matrix look at their joint law as a function of n. So we compute them in, uh, with respect to the normalized trace inside n by n matrices. Then their joint law can be expanded as a first order term plus a first order term plus high order terms. And moreover, with respect to this pair tau tau prime, a n and b n for large n are free uh, in the infinitesimal sense. So, so what does that mean? What's, what's the power of this theorem? It says that actually if I give you a n and b n, and I make copies of them, so I say script a n and script b n, I make a copy of a n, so, so script a n has the same law as a n, and script b n has the same law as b n, but I actually make them honestly free. Okay, so they're no longer matrices, I, I just made them, made, made them in some other probability space, made them free. If I, for instance, add them as if they were free, then what I get is the same thing as if I had added them as matrices up to a high order correction. Okay, so that's what it means. So in particular, if I'm looking at the, at the law of a n plus b n, then I just get the free additive convolution of, of the two laws plus a high order correction. Right? So that tells you, of course, why there would be a connection with free free convolution and things like that. Okay. So, so that's the theorem. So let's just uh, uh, take a little bit of time to work out the example that we're dealing with. So remember, AN is a Gaussian random matrix with complex entries. Now for, for that, you can work out what's the behavior of its law. And it turns out that it's just the semicircle law plus a correction of order 1 over n squared. So there is no 1 over n term. So somehow, if you like, the, the, the type B law of this is the semicircle law and no correction. On the other hand, if you look at Bn, so Bn is theta times a rank 1 matrix. So it's a matrix that has one eigenvalue theta and n minus one eigenvalues 0. If you look at its law, well, here you have it. I've just written it as a perturbation. You know, I've written it as a 1 over n expansion. 
but you see that it has one eigenvalue theta, so there's this one over n delta theta, and then you have one minus one over n times, sorry, yeah, one minus one over n times delta zero, which is to say that you have n minus one eigenvalues delta zero. So that, of course, does depend on n. And so what the theorem is saying is that in order to compute the law of a n plus b n, what you must do is you must compute this type b convolution of the pair a to zero, so this is the semicircle law, no correction, and the pair delta zero, so that's the limit of, of our rank one matrix, which is zero, plus the one over n correction, which you see here is delta theta minus delta zero. So that's what we must compute. Um, yeah, that's the convolution. Now, um, we have this, this, this uh, result with uh, Sherban that allows us to do this analytically. So what you do is you, you call mu and mu dot the resulting thing. So mu is going to be the, the leading order term. Mu dot is the one over n correction. Well, of course, the leading order term is going to be what? It's going to be the free convolution of the semicircle law with the delta function at zero. That does nothing. You just get the semicircle law. And its Cauchy transform is just the Cauchy transform of the semicircle law, which I've written there. Um, to get a handle of mu dot, what you do is you look at the Cauchy transform of that, but in the sense of distribution. So this, this, this d, mu, d mu dot of t, you think of it as a, as a linear functional on sufficiently large class of functions that includes all functions like that, 1 over z minus t. That's, that's a requirement that you put, and actually it turns out that it's, it's, it's satisfied in this case, and it's certainly satisfied for this measure. Okay, and so the general theory that we have with Sherban tells you that you can make sense of the following computation. You can write this g mu dot of z, so given by this formula, you can write it as a derivative in z of the logarithm of z minus t, Right? I mean, that's trivial. But then it turns out that because this here is the distributional derivative of a characteristic function of the interval uh, theta from, what is it, from 0 to theta, it turns out that, that also the free convolution will be a distributional derivative of some kind. So you can write this d mu dot as the derivative of a difference of two monotone functions. Okay, and so then you can do a kind of integration by parts where you you will so write this mu dot as a derivative in t of this thing, and then you do integration by parts and put this derivative on, in t on the log, and so what you get is actually this. Okay, so what you find is that g mu dot of z is the derivative of z of this thing here. And now uh, we also have a formula that tells us what this g mu dot of z is, this is the, this formula that I had. Remember, there was this thing with the derivative of the subordination function and some, some stuff. Anyways, the formula amounts to just this. If you plug in what you have for the... Uh, so f, f mu of z is the reciprocal of this, of this uh, Cauchy transform of the semicircle law, and theta is this, is this theta from here. So you see, uh, you, you see the Cauchy transform of delta theta minus delta zero, right, which is, which is that composed with this f mu of z. And then, then you see the derivative of f mu of z, which was exactly the formula we had. Okay? So to summarize, we have this, this equality. We know that g mu of z is on the one hand this. On the other hand, it's dz of some logarithm. Um, well, and I can write, rewrite this as dz of, of, of this logarithm, right? Because, well, that's, that's exactly what this thing is. And if you now simplify a little bit, you see that this is dz of the logarithm of 1 minus theta g mu of z. So, but on the other hand, I told you that I can write this g mu dot as a kind of Cauchy transform of the difference between two monotone functions. So I have, on the one hand, dz of this logarithm. On the other hand, I have dz of this expression. And then, well, you have two analytic functions which are this, whose derivatives are the same, so they are the same up to, up to normalization, right? And, well, you, you play a little bit with this and you see that the normalization is correct. So actually what you conclude is that the kind of Cauchy transform of this guy is exactly the logarithm of, of, of this guy, right? So if you plug in now the expression that we had for, for the Cauchy transform, finally you get that this guy is just that, okay? So now, now the question is, how do you recover this h plus and h minus, which, remember, 
uh, I mean, our thing is the distributional derivative of H, H plus plus H minus. So this is, this is, I just copied the formula. Well, you, you, you do it by kind of Stilch's inversion formula again, which um, you can justify uh, in, in this case. So you have to analyze the analyticity properties of this function here, and you see what is the problem. The problem is that theta times g mu of z might be equal to 1. So you exactly see this equation. Is there a theta prime? Is there a real solution to, to this equation? This was exactly the equation that was discovered before when we talked about outliers. So there are two regimes. If, if theta, theta was the, the amount of this rank 1 perturbation that we had, if theta is sufficiently big, there is a solution to it. And then when you work out what's going on here, this is the density that you get. You have a delta function at theta prime minus some stuff. Okay? And uh, on the other hand, in the other <coughs> regime, if theta is less than 1 over root 2, there are no real solutions to that. And then when you work out what's going on, you just get the, this part. Okay? So somehow this, this, this delta theta prime comes from the pole or a, a branch cut of this function um, at, at, at that point. All right, uh, so what's this saying? It's saying that if you want to know the, the actual law of our matrix at size n, the answer is you take the semicircle law, that's the leading order term, and then you have a correction mu dot, with mu dot being one of these things. Okay? So in particular, in the appropriate regime, the mu dot predicts an outlier, so this extra eigenvalue at theta prime, and some other regime, it does not. It just predicts some kind of a correction. Okay, so you can actually see how good you are. So what have I done here? I've plotted, so the histograms, um, what you do is you take 40, I took 40 random complex 100 by 100 Gaussian, self-adjoint Gaussian matrices, and then I've looked at the situation where I pertur perturb them by rank 1 projection either with this theta, so I, this outlier eigenvalue 4, or 0 0.4. So the top graphs correspond to theta equals 4, and the, the bottom ones correspond to theta equals 0 0.4. Now, the green thing, the, the little green bars, which I don't know if you can see very well, these are what would happen if the thing were a semicircle law. So what would be the predicted density if we had done no correction? So we just took the semicircle law. The only thing I've done here is I've rescaled it by 99 over 100 because, of course, there's one eigenvalue here, so there are only 99 eigenvalues in, 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 in that region. Now, if you look at, the, at this measure here, you see that it's supported. I mean, it, it's, it blows up near um, uh, the edge, right, near square root of 2, which is the edge of the, of the spectrum here. And so the correction, the 1 over n correction, is maximal near the edges. And if you look closely, this pink thing is where I've plotted the correction. That's a big improvement near the edges, because I don't know if you can see it, but there is uh, uh, the semicircle law misses here. The, the, you know, the prediction here is that it predicts much more eigenvalues than there are. And here it predicts a little bit more eigenvalues than there are, whereas the corrected formula is on the nose in terms of the prediction. right? And then the outlier eigenvalue is predicted to be in that red location. Uh, and, and actually, you see that uh, somewhere nearby there are always eigenvalues. Um, and, and this is the case where theta is small. And again, you see that the semicircle law overestimates things here and underestimates things there, because the semicircle law, of course, is symmetric. But the, the, uh, the resulting distribution is not exactly symmetric. It's slightly skewed because of this extra eigenvalue that somehow gets inserted somewhere there. Uh, and, and you see that our correction takes care of it. You see that it's a much closer fit again at the endpoints. Right? Okay, so that's the... Uh, the I'm sorry? How is the theta zero moving if you change the just the solution to, the, to this equation. I mean, this is just some quadratic equation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as 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 you decrease the as you decrease the the the, the strength, it, it it goes here. Okay. Uh, right. Now, how do you prove this? Well, 
As usual with freeness, what you have to do is you have to check that certain things are true. I mean, certain equations hold, right? And um, as I said, in this case, the law of the, of the Gaussian part has no one over n correction, so you just have the leading order, order term. On the other hand, the, the things by which you perturb these rank one matrices, they have no leading order term, right? They, they, uh, uh, they, they are all zero in, in, in the limit, but, but somehow all their important data is in this one over n correction, right? So this was the prototypical example that we talked about. So what you have to do is you have to somehow understand what happens when you take a bunch of polynomials, say Q1, Q2, and so on, in your, your Gaussian matrix, so Q1 of AN, Q2 of AN, and so forth, and you multiply them around with these finite rank things, and you want to control what happens with such things. Well, if you think about it for a second, if I take, for instance, imagine this E, I, I, R, J1, imagine this guy is, is a rank one projection, and I multiply, let's say, by the same rank one projection. So if I squeeze a matrix, a random matrix A, uh, like that. Well, then what I'm looking at is the 1-1 one, one entry of the, of the matrix Q1 of AN. But the matrix AN is unitarily invariant. So it means that its 1-1 one, one entry looks like its 2-2 two, two entry or 3-3 three, three entry, right? So for the purpose of, of taking expected values, if I were just taking the expected value of the, first, of the first thing, then what I would be getting is just the normalized trace of the matrix. And that's actually what you have to prove. You have to prove that the expected value of the trace of such a product is exactly the product of the normalized traces of these, of these monomials. So I told you it's quite believable. Namely, if, if we were not taking expectations, you, you would imagine, or I mean, yeah, well, what you have to prove in the end is that the expected value of this thing is the product of the expected values. And had, there, had this not been the product of the expected values, but the expected value of a product, this would be quite believable. Okay? So you have to somehow switch between the expected value of a product and the product of expected values, which in general is a bad thing to do in probability. But uh, here you're, you're saved by, by some concentration. Right, so the, these, you, you are in a regime where, where these entries concentrate very well, and so in fact you can switch from one to the other. Or if you like, if you don't want to do this, you can also just do an explicit computation and you know, that comes out in the wash. Okay, so that's, that's all I wanted to say about the proof. Uh, now, you might uh, be very tempted to conjecture something. In fact, this is something that I thought about uh, um, this is a point that we made with, in this paper with Sherban. You might be very um, tempted to conjecture that uh, these kinds of Gaussian matrices are asymptotically, infinitesimally free. Well, if they're complex, of course they are, because if they're complex, then their laws look like something plus no one over order one over n terms so so they're just free up to order one over n squared so therefore they're also free up to order one over n but if you take real matrices then actually you do have a one over n correction and you you're very tempted to say well probably what's going to happen is that these real matrices are going to be asymptotically free infinitesimally and everything is going to be fine and then you say oh how beautiful it is see the complex matrices that go with type A free probability theory the real matrices that go with type B free probability theory everything matches you're in heaven well actually it's false so you don't get freeness kind of for free I mean you have to actually this is an unexpected uh, unexpected result what we proved on the previous page the reason this does not happen for the for the real matrices is because of course they are stable and undertaking central limit sums. I mean, if I take a whole bunch of copies of, of a real Gaussian matrix and make these copies independent, and then, then I do this kind of summation, then I get something that looks like one of them, because, of course, you know, Gaussians are, are preserved under central limit sums. And so if these things were asymptotically uh, infinitesimally free, you would get that the law of, of Y1n, so a, a to a to prime, will be the same thing as if I were to take a k-fold convolution of a to and a to prime and then rescale by 1 over root k. But there is a free uh, type B central limit theorem that tells you that if you do such a thing, you always converge to the analog of the, of the semicircle law. 
And this analog of the semicircle law is to first order, of course, a semicircular, but to second order, it's arc sine minus semicircular, as it turns out. But Johansson computed the 1 over n correction for, for a real matrix, and it is not a, uh, an arc sign. It looks completely different. In fact, it's some delta functions at the edges of the spectrum minus you know, some, some other stuff. Okay? So it's different. And these, so, so these things are not free. Okay? So uh, the statement that I, I had before about freeness from, from these finite rank matrices is somehow special. There is something going on which does not happen for, for real matrices. Now, let's see, what else can we do? Um, you can actually, the statement that I had, so this kind of freeness statement, you can upgrade it to a, another situation that was studied extensively in the uh, finite rank perturbation case. So, you, 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 the, the perturbation matrix, you, you take the same, so you take some kind of a, a diagonal matrix um, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, B, B and you take the same, a, a finite rank matrix, but A and you change. Instead, you take some matrix Dn with some prescribed eigenvalues that converge somewhere, and then you, you randomly rotate it by unitary. So the statement is again that A n like that, so randomly rotated um, unitarily invariant matrix, is going to be asymptotically free in this infinitesimal sense from finite rank things. So in particular, you can discuss what happens when you take a finite rank perturbation of such a thing. And this was, as I said, rather extensively studied, and, and, and you get what you want. Um, we can also do the, the real case. So again, you do recover this kind of freeness between A and the finite rank matrices. Um, the only difference is that uh, in the complex case, the matrix A had no 1 over n term. In the real case, it does. So this is what that 1 over n term looks like. And the resulting thing is that when you do a finite rank perturbation of A, you have to modify what answer you had before by adding together, by adding in this term. But okay, that's, that's the only modification. Now, I should say that the kind of stuff that, that we did here, I mean, because we chose to encode this, this kind of outlier behavior by looking at, uh, you know, things like this, at, at 1 over n term in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in the law, the resulting, so what we get is much, much weaker than what people are able to get. I mean, the professional random, random matricians, unlike me, can, can get uh, out of this problem. I mean, they now know very well where, not just where this outlier is expected to be, but they'll tell you that, you know, with very high probability it is there, with very high probability there's nothing between it and the, the edge of the spectrum, and all kinds of things are available in, in very precise ways. But um, the, the advantage of our method is that once we've established this freeness result, like in, 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 in Voiculescu's theorem, you immediately have it available for not just sums, you have it for anything, right? So with no added terms, we, we can, no added difficulty, we can look at things like products of these things or more complicated things, right? So, um, so that's, that's the thing. And plus, you know, in my opinion, it's nice because it, it explains why the, there is this link with free probabilities. So I think that was my last slide, so thank you very much for...